everybody. Welcome to the Uncommon Comedy Podcast. I am your host, Brian April, and I am so excited for, for this week's show. But first, I want to remind you that uh, our podcasts are available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and on Spotify. Uh, you can also check us out on Facebook and on YouTube. Uh, Facebook is at Uncommon Comedy. Instagram is at Uncommon Comedy Tour. And YouTube is at Uncommon Comedy Podcast. So we're going to get into it this week. I'm I say this every week, and I know I say that every week. I'm really excited about my guest because she is actually one of the original members of the Uncommon Comedy Tour. Um, she is an author. She is a comedian. She is an artist, and she's a speaker. And uh, she has a book called "It's Called a Spade." I can get it in the light. Can't get it anyway. It's called a spade. Um, she has a dry bar special out, and if you don't know who she is, I, and I say this every time I, I end up talking to her, uh, I truly believe in the next five to ten years she's going to be a household name. She's amazing. She's special. I absolutely love her, and you guys are going to love her too. So please welcome JJ Barrows. JJ, Yay! hi Ryan. Hi. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm good. How are you? Doing well. Doing well. Yeah, you were one of the original uncommon comedy uh tour people yeah and then uh she grew up and got herself management and so <laughs> now she's you know on to bigger and better things and we're no, very proud of you very proud of you no we're very 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 happy for you so um but i was like i gotta get her on the podcast you know just oh, for sure. I totally. remember the table meeting actually at Lisa's house when we were when we were like just the birthing station of uncommon comedy, and it was just really cool to have like different voices and different people and kind of sorting through what it looked like to do comedy. And, and the whole point was we were trying to find a common thread between <laughs> all of us that we could use to market, and then we realized we don't really have anything in common, like <laughs> other than doing comedy. But it's like, but that's the world, so it's cool to see. How much heart you put into making it be wow. such an awesome thing. So I feel honored that I was at the, the first table meeting. Well, I think you actually came up with Uncommon Comedy. I think you were the one who said yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. So, so if people don't like the name of this podcast, it's JJ's fault. Sorry, uh, and you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so we're, we're going to talk some some comedy. Uh, but what I, I always do on this is I always like to talk a little bit about the, the performer. And what I love um, – about you as a performer is you have this uh, charisma, you have this energy, this uh, likability, this natural um, charm, and you are very authentic on stage. So people know that when you're done talking, they know JJ. And I think that that's just so cool. And um, you just have this infectious energy that, that people love to be around. And so that's, Oh, I look thanks. at it and I'm like, why can't I get that? Why can't I get that? <laughs> so, uh, oh, and thanks, so you, you, you make me laugh and you make me half smile. Um, <laughs> and for those who can't see me, I have facial paralysis. So that's why I half smile. Um, <laughs> I love it. I'll take it. Yeah. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, your career. Um, so tell me who inspired you to do stand up or what inspired you anyway? Ugh. Um, <laughs> it's such a loaded question because I don't think um, I don't, nobody inspired me to do stand up. I, I wasn't the the kid that had dreamt of doing stand up her whole life, you know, or who was like, I want to, I'm going to be a comedian. Um, in some ways I feel like I still wrestle with like imposter syndrome, like because I hear so many comedian stories of how they always, you know, looked up to so-and-so and they listened to their records until they had to memorize and they recited, you know, and it was in their blood, it was in their veins. And I just, so many times I've been like, does that mean I'm not a real comedian? Because <laughs> um, that wasn't my story at all. Not to say I didn't love comedy. I think, I don't know, I just didn't really grow up with an understanding of it being its own genre or or even being a tool um, to reach people and communicate um, stuff with depth and with meaning. I, I kind of just thought, you know, jokes are funny and, and stuff like that. And so um, that said, I really just stumbled into it. Um, and very much later in life, I would say, I, I don't even know how much I found stand up comedy so much as it found me, which sounds so cliche and cheesy, but just cause it's cliche and cheesy doesn't mean it's not true. <laughs> I just, I wasn't looking for it. And, um, well I was, I, I was, but it was because I was in a really tough, dark season of life and I just needed 
change and I needed um, uncomfortability, maybe, maybe, so to speak, to get me out of just this stagnant nothingness that I kind of felt that I was in and I, I didn't know how to get out of. And so just, um, you know, I, I joke that at the time I couldn't really afford weekly therapy. And so I just kind of looked up, I don't know, just other means of, of finding ways to kind of like express myself maybe in, in a safe place. And so I, I had read about um, improv and I, I like the idea of sketch comedy. I always loved SNL. And I was like, oh, if that's what that is, like, I love SNL, you know, cool. And if it's, if it's a classroom setting, like, you know, it's not like I'm going on stage right away. I'm just kind of finding an outlet to express myself. And so I had tried to sign up for an improv class, but the I didn't know the improv class was full and it happened to be a stand up class. And I was like, that's probably the same thing. And I mean, that's how much I didn't know <laughs> about stand up. Like I had no frame of reference. I had no comedians that I could list off. Like, well, this is who I look up to and this is this is who I want to be. I had no idea Ellen was a comedian to begin with. Like, I thought she was a talk show host. Like, that was it. Like, I didn't, I had no idea. And so, um, so yeah, but, and so I went anyways. And I remember my first day of class, Tony Calabrese's class in San Diego. And I remember, and, and I've had friends who have said, you're funny. Like I was, I, I definitely was a late bloomer. I was the ugly duckling of the group. I love myself now, but it doesn't mean I didn't go through my own. We all survived middle school somehow. Right. And so, right. and it doesn't mean those thoughts leave you. And so, um, you know, I've definitely, um, have been praised. I don't know if praise is the right word, but I've had my personality commented on before or noticed before, especially when I was younger, more so than my looks. And so I knew I had personality, but going to a stand-up class, it was like, it was a group of funny people, all of whom were the funny person in their group. Mm -hmm. So you, even going to the class, it was like, oh yeah, I'm funny, I could do this. But then you get there and you realize everyone's funny and you're like, oh my God, do I belong? <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't know. And so, um, but yeah, I just remember um, we got on stage that first day and, and everyone kind of, you know, Tony asked us like, why are you here? Like, why do you want to do comedy? And everyone had all these answers like, oh, it's a bucket list dream or, oh, I've always wanted to be a comedian or, oh, some people were like, I have to, you know, do a work challenge, diversity thing for my whatever. All, they had all these great answers. And I was kind of nervous to get up there and I just got up there and I was like, honestly, I just couldn't afford therapy and I needed a way to express myself. <laughs> and everyone kind of laughed and I was like, oh, like I just, I didn't even know that I just, by being honest me, could be funny in a way that connected with people because everyone could kind of relate to what I was saying. And I didn't know that that was a thing in comedy, that part of what is making something so funny is that people are like, yeah, me too. Like they're laughing at the fact that they can relate to it and, and and Tony just kind of um honed in really quickly on my on my style on being on being a storyteller and would just ask he would ask everyone you know ask all of us questions about our lives and then we'd have to take that home and write about it you know bring it back and we'd edit it it was this whole process of learning i've always been a storyteller but for me comedy was learning how to tell stories in a structured way you know, set up punchline, tagline, all, all the, there, I didn't know there's all, you know, I always thought if I did see a comedian before, I just thought they got up on stage and they just started talking. Like I had no idea, you know, all this work <laughs> went into it. And, and it is funny because the class, I think it started out with maybe like 15 people total at the beginning. And at the end of the six weeks, it was like five or six of us, I think, because people don't realize how much work really goes into even just like five minutes of material. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just work. Um, but Tony, Tony really, um, he said he saw something in me. And I think for me, I, you know, we all struggle with insecurities in our own ways. But I think for me, and especially the season of life that I was coming out of, that was so difficult to hear someone um, who had authority in the in the realm in which I was functioning in that moment, the realm being comedy, um, hear someone of authority say, you've really got something. And if you want to do something with it, you just, all you have to do is make the choice. Um, you just have to keep doing it. Cause even though, you know, you got it and you're good, but it's, it's still work. You know, right. you, you still gotta, you still gotta work at it. You still, there's so much to put into it. And so, yeah, I think someone really kind of pulling that out, um, of me, what was really helpful. And so, 
I was kind of naive, honestly, like when I first started. And I think starting in San Diego, like, I mean, I, you, you're one of the first people in, in that community that I met in comedy. So I think in that way, I was very fortunate to start in San Diego because I pretty quickly found a community of people that made me really enjoy the process, even when the process got hard. And I kind of was naive for a little bit. Like I kind of just thought everybody's experience with comedy was just kind of like having fun with friends <laughs> and doing shows. And if there was a show that didn't go as well, you were with your buddies and you were like, did you see that guy? Like you talked about the audience together, whatever. Like I just thought it was a communal experience. And it wasn't really until further down the road and maybe doing shows elsewhere or, you know, coming across other comedians or realizing even comedians who are friends are still comedians who are competing for stage time. And it can get kind of ugly sometimes, like whether intentionally or not. Um, and so in some ways, it, it, I'm, I'm kind of glad that I was a little bit naive because it kept me going forward, even though I didn't know the the danger I was walking toward as far as, you know, I don't know, emotionally and, mm -hmm. and just realizing people are people. Um, but it also just kind of helped prepare me for when it did get hard. I had already done it enough and I had already experienced the part of it that I liked enough to keep doing it, even though it got hard. Right. Um, and, and that's what, what comedy does. You have one show or one experience that's amazing. And that makes all the, 99 prior to it yeah. worth it and you're like okay i'll do that again but yeah. I, I remember um when i first um when i first met you well before i met you i had uh lisa who's also in our group um said oh you've got to see you know you've got to see this girl jj she's she's got something you know and then tony said to me the same thing like she's got something and i was like okay you know and uh we were at a show and I don't remember which show it was. And I know we've talked about this before. I don't remember exactly which show, but uh, you went up and I was like, oh yeah, totally. And I think the, you see a lot of people who, especially so early on have no clue as to what they're doing and don't have it. And you see a lot of people who are years in that don't have the same sort of personality and stage presence and, and the things that you have naturally. And so I think we all kind of just said, no, we're, we're protecting this one. Like, so that, yeah. you, you know, that the, uh, you know, the, the other comedians don't get uh, in and, and ruin this because you can just see, you just go, Oh, yeah. totally. She's going to, you know, take right off. And, and you've been doing a, a great job with that. So Thanks. I've, I've always been, I've always been a fan. I'll always be a fan. Um, so now that you've kind of got into stand up a little bit and you've done some, some research on comedians, who are some of the comedians that you like? Now that I know who comedians are. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I know you're a big Robin Williams fan. Yeah, but you know, it's funny. I mean, growing up in the 90s, I didn't know Robin Williams, the stand-up. I didn't know this crazy, you know, character, you know, in the 70s, 80s. I, I know Miss Doubtfire. Right. You know, <laughs> like that was my like first experience. I love when I saw Miss Doubtfire, I was like, I love this man or woman or whatever. I love him. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and and so, and I do, I love Robin Williams. And especially once I got into comedy, going back and researching, I'm very different from Robin Williams. I think it's, and so I, I think I still am trying to, a lot of people say, oh, well, find who you look up to in your craft and study them. What do you like about it? What do you not? What what worked? What doesn't? Da, 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 da. And so I love Robin Williams and his and, and his comedy, it's been fascinating to have grown up on Robin Williams, the actor, to then rediscover him as, as the, as the stand-up comedian. Same with Steve Martin. You know, mm. I, I grew up with Steve Martin, Father of the Bride, like one right. of my favorite movies, <laughs> Three Amigos, like The Jerk, uh, yep. Dirty Rotten right. Scoundrels. Like I knew Steve Martin, the actor, but I didn't know there was this wild and crazy <laughs> guy, you know? Have you seen like, The Lonely Guy? By the way, have you seen the one? I don't think guy? I've seen that one. So funny. Okay, Such I'll look it up. Yeah, it's a good Steve Martin movie. Okay, I wrote it down. Um, but yeah, I, so it was really fun for me getting into comedy and actually discovering some of my favorite people, um, acting wise, were originally comedians. Like that was really, really fascinating to me. Um, and so. But style wise, I would say I really, really most resonate with and enjoy watching um, Mike Birbiglia. Mm -hmm. 
is one of my favorites. Um, I think I discovered him. I did discover him even before I got into comedy, but I still, this idea of stand-up comedian, I, I knew it was a thing. It just was so foreign to me. And I remember I was living in Portland, Oregon at the time. And again, my friends who kind of knew I was the funny one, but I was in, by no means like doing comedy. I remember a friend being like, you should check out this guy, Mike Birbiglia. He has these really uh, funny jokes like about food and like just like, but they're like his stories. Right. And so it was kind of the first time I had heard someone tell stories and it was the way that he told them that was so funny to me. Um, you know, it wasn't Mitch Hedberg. I love Mitch Hedberg. I love these one liner jokes. I'm not a joke writer though. I know that about myself. And so even though I can appreciate watching that form of comedy, I love it. I didn't know how to make that resonate with me because I knew I'm not, I'm not capable of replicating that. And if I did, it wouldn't come across as very good, you know, cause it's just, it's just not my style. And so I would say style wise, as far as, Comedians, Mike Birbiglia um, is a huge one for me. I also really like, um, oh, see, this is where I really struggle because <laughs> I'm thinking of some that I know, like personally, and then I'm oh, thinking of like, uh, I love Mark Christopher Lawrence. I yep. love his style. I, he's also a storyteller. Like yep. he just, I don't know. It's the way that he, it's his facial expressions and his mannerisms and the voices and his eye, like his eyes will get real big. Like yeah. he's, he's, he's physical without being physical. I don't know if that he's not like, you know, Robin Williams was maybe like bouncing all over the place. Whereas Mark, he commands the space in which he's in. And yet he's also still so very active with what he's saying. And so I, which, For by the it, way, if you want to see the Mark Christopher Lawrence interview from the Uncommon Comedy Podcast, yeah. <laughs> check out episode one. Uh, so. Oh, he's the first one. He's That's the right. first one. Yep. Yeah. I, yeah. So I, I love, I love Mark, and and I feel really, really uh, fortunate. I feel blessed and lucky that I got to start um, pretty early on, actually getting to kind of learn under Mark. I mean, he's had me on so many of his shows he's he's been a, a big support too so to get to watch somebody up close who's who's kind of style and aspect i already kind of relate to um is really great um i'm trying to think of who else i'm like i'm rolodex uh nate bargoski i can't ever really pronounce his last mm -hmm. name correctly but again storyteller it's these storyteller comedians that i find myself watching over and over um i love kevin hart also a storyteller <laughs> different kind of storyteller very active, very right. fast. And then we're going over here. And, now, and so like, it, it's just a different um, level of energy, even as a, as a viewer, as a watcher, right? Like right. I watch Nate and Nate's kind of like, yeah, can you believe it? And then I was, he's so like calm and monotone and you're watching like, yeah. And you're laughing with Kevin Hart. You're like, it's like, you're listening as, as he's like jumping, you know? Yeah. And so even just the listening experience, um, is so different with each one, but I would definitely say storyteller comics are the, the, the ones I end up watching the most because it's the style that I most relate to. And it's, um, I, don't know, I just, I love stories. I love, I love a good story. <laughs> nice. Uh, do you remember your first comedy show? My first ever comedy show? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, if this counts, it was my graduation comedy show uh, after doing this this class for six weeks. Um, we had a little, I don't know, it was like maybe 25, 30 person theater in San Diego. And it was after we had done the six weeks of, you know, showing up every week and practicing on stage in front of each other and yada, yada, yada. And then you got five minutes to perform. And, um, Honestly, mine was, again, I think it helped that I was naive. My first comedy show ever was awesome. Like it just, I don't have that story of like, and then I bombed and then it was the worst. And then it, and it. Now, granted, if I were to go back and watch that show, I would probably watch it and be like, oh my gosh, that was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> but so I'm not saying like I did amazing, but I'm, I did what I came there to do, which was which was the material that I had practiced in those six weeks, which was just me coming out of a tough season of life. So for me to even show up and, and present myself, and I invited a ton of my own friends, so it helped that half yeah. the audience was already supportive of me. Right. 
Um, and I got a great reaction and, and I, I, I really loved it. Um, and, it, and that my experiencing that is part of what made me want to do it again, because it was like, if this really could work, if I really can do this, yeah, I want to try to do it. Yeah. Um, cause like I said, I, I've always known I've had the ability to tell a story and I would say, I would say a long time ago, I really, I discovered the stage and I discovered that I, I felt like I was where I belonged and I was doing what I was created to do when I was on that stage. But discovering comedy as the tool to use when I was on that stage, that was a very, that was a very new thing. And so to kind of find that merging at that, at that place in time um, was really cool. So, I mean, sometimes I really wish I, you know, I just, I wish I could relate I hear other comedians telling their like battle stories of like their first shows. And I, you know, I'm very quietly in the corner, like mine was awesome. <laughs> so do you remember your, uh, the, the first show that wasn't with friends? Oh gosh. That wasn't <laughs> with friends. Um, if not, it's fine, but let's see. Cause that's usually what happens is a lot of people will, uh, for the people who are listening, you, your first show, you, you bring a ton of people, yeah. you pack it, Everyone laughs for you. You feel amazing. And then like the next week you go and you don't know anybody and it's just death. You know, it's just silence yep. and crickets and uh, comedy punches you in the face. Yeah. Um, ah, we'll get we'll get to bad shows in an in event. In a yeah. Ah, don't worry about that. Okay. So, <laughs> trust me, it's coming. Um, yeah. How long do you think it, it took uh, before things started to click for you on stage? Honestly, I feel like sometimes I'm still waiting for the click. Mm. Um, I, it's a kind of a twofold answer. <clears throat> I feel like the stage itself, something clicked for me a long time ago. Um, in the same way that you hear a lot of singers say like when I first stood on stage at my church and sang the blah, 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 like they knew they had some calling or whatever. And I remember it was like, I was, I think I was in college and it was one Christmas and I don't know why I was asked to share a part of my story during like a Christmas service or something at church. And I wasn't like, you know, I, I, I wasn't like trying to go out and be a speaker or have something to say. I don't really know how that, I don't remember how it came about. Um, and I did it and I remember, I just remember this. I remember the feeling of hearing the audience listening to me. So I wasn't doing comedy at the time I was speaking, but I, I remember just speaking from my heart, showing up as myself and, and it was like pin drop silent in the room. But the silence was so loud because I, mm -hmm. I, I felt like I could hear them listening to me. I could hear that I had their attention. And I was like, what is this? <laughs> like, it was just like, <laughs> if, I have a, if I have a place here, like, I, I need to explore this. Because if this is something that makes me feel alive and that also helps other people, that's where the gold's at for me. That's sacred ground right there. Um, and so that was my first click, I think, with, with the stage was that experience. Well, then introduce comedy. I think I had a comfortability because I already had a comfortability on stage. I think that's why I maybe just have, have been fortunate early on. I didn't have to work through the stage fright aspect of it. I didn't right. have to work through how to find my comfortability levels on stage. I just kind of already had it for me. Um, it was more or less how to infuse it with comedy. And so I think when I was more naive in my early years of doing comedy, even though if I were to go back and watch some of those shows, I would probably be like, my gosh, I was talking so much. I wasn't getting to the punchline. Like I, I could very easily just be like, it is not that good. But the feeling I had while doing it, those are some of my absolute favorite shows to date, mm -hmm. the the early shows, because there's this, there's this ignorance or there's this naivety that you don't know whether it's what you're doing or what's expected or what the professionals are comparing you to. You're just having fun being in the moment. And if it's working, 
you don't have anything else to go off of other than this is fun and it's working right and the audience right. doesn't know any different um and yeah there's definitely a switch when it, it hits from uh i'm doing this and i'm having fun to now there's expectations and i'm getting paid and right it's work yeah and i think when i started i got uh, when i started i knew i was new so there's this like grace, right? There's this like, oh, well, I'm just learning. Like I don't, I'm just figuring this out. And I already knew everybody on the show was probably better than me because of how long they'd have been doing comedy. So there wasn't this like, oh, I hope I'm good enough. I hope I can, you know, match up. I hope it was just like, I'm just learning. So I'm, <laughs> you know, and I think because people responded to me. How long, when I, when they would be like, how long have you been doing comedy? And I'd be like, six months. They'd be like, what? Six months? Like they were like shockingly surprised, like in a good way. Um, I kind of, I don't know. I kind of just like, even though I appreciated that, I kind of settled for this place of like, oh, I'm, I'm kind of good. Like I'm, I'm good for a beginner. I kind of, I kind of got it. Mm -hmm. Except that the more that, the longer I've done comedy, the more I, get into the business side of it or see how other comedians can be or understand there's this whole culture within comedians that you're not even a comedian unless you've done it 10 years. Like, like more hesitancy starts to take place, right? Like a little more insecurity, a little more of like uncertainty of like whether or not I belong. And it's not to say that I don't. And it's not to say that those things are totally true it's just it's like when you're a kid you're sheltered from a few things that the world knows and the the older you get you get opened up to these ideas or these beliefs and they might not be right or wrong but all of a sudden you're having to take in and absorb things that you didn't even worry about before right, right. and so there's a lot more anxiety that goes into shows the more that i know versus me just showing up and having fun when i didn't know anything but you know, I think, but there's something interesting with that is you started off with something that it takes most people years or decades to get to, which is being themselves, being genuine right. on stage. That's like the most important thing you talk to. I've, I've talked to a lot of people on this and they're all like, just, you have to be yourself. You have to be yourself. You have to be yourself. And because when you start off, when most people start off, is they're feeling that anxiety that you're describing of like, okay, I need to do this and I, I don't know this and I have to, you know, I, I have to learn comedy and timing and punchlines and, you know, callbacks and right. all these, these things. Uh, you have to learn the comedy part. And so they're playing a character on stage of a comedian. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, I'm, I'm this and I'm totally cool. And then over time, you would learn that and you start to shed all that and you just become who you are on stage. And so you, I think that's why most people uh, just look at you and go, you've only been doing it this long because you have that um, ability to just go up and be yourself unapologetically uh, yourself. And that's so hard for people to do. A lot of people, and I, I've struggled with that for a long time. Yeah. I still struggle with that. I, I evolve and I go, oh, what do I want to be? You know, I, I've, I've changing as a person and let me do this. And so it's, it's one of those things. So I, I think that's a, a very fortunate uh, for you. So now it's like, you know, once you, and I, I'm not saying you don't know, but once you learn all the comedy <laughs> stuff, it's going to come to, it comes together even better. Yeah. So. Yeah. I think, yeah, it's weird. It's like, sometimes I feel like I don't know that it's, I feel like when someone says, when did you know it clicked? It's supposed to be this, this thing that happens where, oh, now I'm good. I got it. I don't have to, because I know I got it. I don't have to worry when I go on stage. And maybe that is a thing. And maybe that's how it works for some people. But I think for me, I get nervous, even still. Yep. I get nervous every time before I go on stage. Because no matter how many times I've done amazing or killed it or whatever, every audience is different. There are no guarantees. It just doesn't matter. There's just no... Like, yeah, there can be kind of like assumptions, like, oh, yeah, you know, I, I know this mm -hmm. material works. It's usually fine across the board. I have it all memorized, it, like for sure. But there's still no guarantees. And if you are keeping in mind how, the, if you're comparing any show to the last show, that that in and of itself will set you up for for anxiety, whether it's that you want to do better or whether it's your, you, you hope you don't do as bad or, or whatever it may be. Um, I compare it a lot with surfing. I love to surf. For me, comedy and surfing, 
oh my gosh, they're like the same for me. Like when I'm struggling with a season of like insecurity and uncertainty in comedy, I will make myself go out and go surf every day because that gives me the confidence to remind myself that like I'm strong, I'm capable. And I might feel the fear every time I get in the ocean. I'm, I'm so nervous. I'm so scared because the ocean's different every day. You're not, right. you're never guaranteed the same waves today that you had yesterday and, and, and so on and so forth. And so you might've had an amazing day yesterday and then you get out the next day all cocky, like, yeah, I rule this ocean, but the ocean wins every time. It, it will decide if you, if you rule or not that day, you know? And so, and so even though I know how to surf, I'm good at surfing, I'm confident in it because, because the ocean is the, at the end of the day, I'm not the only say on whether or not Mm -hmm. I'm that good. The ocean is the final say. I get nervous. It's a respectful nervous. Same with the audience. It's a respectful nervous. It's a, I want to entertain these people. I care about what they think. Not in a, I need them to validate me so that I love myself. I right. know my foundation. I know my worth. But it doesn't mean I don't want to go out there and do a good job and please and entertain the audience that I'm going out in front of. And so I don't know. I don't know if it's a same with surfing like I did have a click where oh I figured out how it works but it doesn't mean that every time I go out I still don't get kind of nervous even if right. it's a small day I'm, it's just this respectful like I mean sometimes I'll even talk to the ocean as I'm like hey I'm here today just want you to know like we're we're on the same team like I'm good <laughs> you're good I want to have fun same thing when I go into a space I love to see the the space before I perform and I and I'll whether it's pray over it or just like speak to the atmosphere that it's just like, hey, I want to bring good things tonight. Like I want people to laugh. I don't know what's going on in their lives. I don't know what they're struggling with. If someone just needs humor, it, I, it's not even necessarily about people liking me, even though I want them to like me. Right. I want to be I would be honored to be the person that gets to give them a moment of relief from all the chaos. And I just kind of speak that into being as I like enter that atmosphere. Um, and that's a great, that's a great attitude to really have. Cause that really just makes, it makes, it takes a lot more pressure off. Um, yeah. You know, because you can go, well, I tried and yeah. I did, you know, I did what I was, I did the best that I, I could do. I did my job and yeah. hopefully somebody in, enjoyed that. Um, what is the best piece of advice that you've received about comedy? The best piece of advice I received about comedy is, um, especially if you're going to like pursue it as a, as a job or as a career, um, be okay being a small fish. What's the saying? Be okay. No, sorry. Let me start over. <laughs> be okay being a big fish in a small pond before going to be a small fish in a big pond. Meaning like when I started in my class, like Tony had said, nine times out of 10, whenever, whenever people decide they want to do comedy, they think, oh, I got to move to LA. I got to go where the scene is, or I got to go to New York. I got to go wherever, you know? Right. And, and they don't even take the time to work on their craft in an area that gives them the time and the space to do so because there's stage time available. Right. They just think they have to go to the place Meaning, and this place has hundreds of thousands of people vying for three minutes of time that they may or may not get. And so, yeah, you might have went to the space where comedy happens, but you're not getting any time perfecting that your craft. So that even if you do happen to get in front of the right people at the right time, you're not even ready because you haven't done anything to prepare yourself. Right. Because um, one of my favorite quotes is Kevin Hart was being interviewed and. Um, someone had made the comment, like, what does it feel like to be a success, an overnight success? And he was like, overnight? He was like, I've been doing this for 20 years or something like that. I'm yeah. going to butcher it. But he essentially was saying, like, I might have happened to be in the right place at the right time where someone saw me to put me in front of, you know, a mass audience. But that's only because I was so prepared. Right to be who I was when they saw me from the last 20 years that I had been perfecting that. And so when I was in San Diego, it was like, sure, San Diego might not be the Mecca of comedy, even though I think there's a great scene there. Um, for me, it was like, yeah, I don't need to just up and go to LA because LA is where everybody goes. I have stage time available 
all the time, whether it's open mics, whether it's shows, whether it's friends that put on things. There were so many opportunities to actually practice getting in the stage time. Cause that's the thing. Like you can, there's just, you can't, same with surfing. You can be as fit as you want to. The only thing that will make you good at surfing is actually surfing. There's no exercise mm. like it. Same with comedy. You can read all the books. You can watch all the comedians. You can do all the things. The only thing that's going to make you a good comedian is getting on the stage. Is just doing the thing. Mm -hmm. And so that was the best piece of advice that I got was um, be okay being a big fish in a small pond before being a little fish in a big pond. Because that's how you're going to really perfect your craft and hone in. Well, right. And like you were saying, when and when you do go up to LA, you have to be ready because you're battling all the big fish from the, all the small ponds. Yep. So it's you really have to make sure that you're you're ready to go. Yeah. Um, so what is your writing process like? I'm trying to get better. <laughs> I'm trying to get more disciplined at it. That's why that's why I love taking the class because there was this accountability where every week you would show up, you would have to present, you know, what you worked on. And, and it kind of, and it forced me to, um, but I would say, honestly, I usually just, it's almost as if I was journaling. If I sit down and try to approach something like I'm going to tell a joke, like I'll just, even now, if people are like, Oh, you're a comedian. Tell me a joke, which is like the worst thing you could ever say to a comedian. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but even if like, I didn't mind that question, I would, I still panic because I don't, I just don't tell jokes and I don't have an arsenal and I can't even think of a joke off the top of my head to be like, what would be a good one right now? Right. Um, so if I try to approach it with like, okay, I want to write something funny. I'll, I'll just end up coming up blank. And so I start my process basically almost as if my intention is just to journal. I just have to get everything out. And sometimes what I'm getting out might not even be what I'm going to work on, but I have to get it out of the way in order to work on what I need to work on. And so sometimes in that process, something will come up or a theme or I'll be like, oh yeah, that was kind of funny when that happened. And I'll like circle that or I'll take that sentence and I'll write it elsewhere. And then I'll take that from all of that gunk and I take it over here and I work more on that. And I, I don't know, just try to form it. And it, how, how mm -hmm. do you make you know this funny? I mean, and you know, I think more than anyone, I still struggle with, I, I still struggle with like the process of like taking out all the details. Cause I'm like, as I'm a storyteller, which is great. But at the same time, when you're trying to do comedy, it's like, get to the point. And you say that to me all the time, <laughs> get to the point. And so, um, yeah, it, 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 sometimes I'll write it out to where I think I have it all, you know, fine tuned and whatever. And I'll send it off to someone. I'll send it to you or I'll send it to someone. I'm like, can you tell me what you think it is? And it's like, there's too many words there, you know? And so then it's like, yeah, go back and like, what do you need and, and what do you not need? And I, I still am trying to learn how to like punch it up as they say. Um, Cause I think, and, and you make fun of me and Lisa, I think all the time for doing this is <laughs> I get too hung up on the truth. You know, not, mm -hmm. comedy is usually based on truth. You're telling, you know, these two stories, but it's the truth plus like 15, 30%. You know, it's just this exaggerate for the sake of comedy. Right. right? Um, yeah. I always say it's it's the truth, but just embellished or enhanced for yeah. a comedic effect. Because you say, because I, I, I can think of like numerous times where you've been <laughs> like, well, why don't you just say, you know, you add something, which is really funny. And I'll go, yeah, but that didn't happen. <laughs> you're like it doesn't matter they don't know that <laughs> exactly well i i always say never let facts uh facts get in the way of a good joke yeah exactly <laughs> yeah and i remember i i remember hearing i don't know if it was a famous person or someone's grandma but i remember someone saying never let the truth get in the way of a good story and so the same applies yep. with 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 comedy i it's so powerful i'd never really thought of it or big fit the movie big fish i remember um someone saying to me at one point as a storyteller, they said, Oh, big fish, you're the guy, you're the granddad. And I was like, what is that supposed to mean? And it's not that his stories weren't true. It's that just, he told them in a way mm -hmm. that were so magical. You, you didn't like, you did kind of make the son grow up to have issues and not sure if he could trust his dad, but there was a resolve in the end. It's a great movie for <laughs> no one who's seen it. But yeah, it's this idea of like the power of story and learning how to use it in a way that, um, it's not so stuck to the facts, but that's actually in a way that's moving and meaningful or with comedy that's humorous and that invokes a feeling of emotion and laughter. I like it.
Yeah. Uh, yeah. We, you're, we you're a good about, teacher we, in that way. We, we talk about that a lot. And I, yeah, we do. It's, it's very, it's a, it's something I definitely harp on because it's, you know, um, if, if you're waiting for the entire story to be true, you are going to be working on material time. for a long time. <laughs> you, I think that, you, need, yeah. you know, when you go to the grocery store and something happens and you say to the lady, boom, you're like, well, I didn't say that. Well, yeah, that's going to be a long time before the lady says something that's really funny. That's totally you know, going to be worth going on stage with. I do remember you saying that. Um, Oh, I'm trying to. I'm trying to remember the way in which you said it. I had it, and then I lost it. But yeah, I remember you. Oh, I remember you saying, you said, JJ, you either have to figure out how to add the humor in the spots that you're looking for, or you're gonna have to figure out how to live the funniest life ever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's okay. I see what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, that's so. Oh. It's the other way is probably easier. Yeah, totally. But um, so, what what is the here's the here we were talking about bad shows. What is the worst show you ever had? Worst show I ever had. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> already laughing. Worst show I ever had, <laughs> without a shot of a doubt, was the show. In uh, I hate to say it, just in case anyone I know is ever listening, but it's in Charleston, South Carolina. I was home during the holiday or. Er, no, I was home in the fall. I was about to do a really big show in my hometown, and I hadn't been on stage in a while. Um, I'd been traveling a lot, and I think it, a month, maybe a month or so, since I'd been on stage. And um, for for people who don't know, I think for comedians, spending any amount of time off stage, it just creates all the more anxiety about the next time that you have to go on stage. And so having that's why this quarantine thing is like, <laughs> oh my god, I'm living in so much fear right now. I'm never going to be on stage again. Which isn't totally true, but it is. It's a thing. It's like you get rusty. You know, you mm -hmm. get like, oh, yeah, it's same again, same thing with surfing. It's like the amount of time you spend out of the water, you forget that you're good at it. You forget your confidence. You forget, and you're like, oh, can I do this? And maybe in the beginning, there's this awkward kind of like readjustment, but then you, you your muscle memory kicks back in, you figure out, and you go. And so that's why they say, try to be consistent with, with stage time. I remember that's something that you would always tell me to do. And so at this particular point, it had been a month. I think since I'd been on stage and I had a really big show coming up. And so I was kind of nervous with my big show being the show that I got back on stage with. And so someone had said, um, there's a, you know, they had a show in Charleston that I could come and I could do, I could do some time there. And um, so it would be this little theater and um, I had like a 12 minute spot, I think. And I was like, that sounds great. Perfect. Um, and then the day of, I or I think it was, we were already driving down there. My husband was with me, and I got a message, and the guy was like, "Oh, like heads up! Apparently, the theater was rented out today for the FSU some football game in the South. Which is, if you're in the South, that's a big deal. Right. Football is a big deal. And so they said um, the theater couldn't actually use the theater for the show. It had been blocked out, and they kind of forgot about it." So the show's going to be at the barbecue pit next door. <laughs> and just the word barbecue pit, I was like, oh, God. Because <laughs> any show that is in a bar or a brewery or a winery or it could be the nicest restaurant in the world. It doesn't, it's not personal, but it's just a comedy show is not meant to function in a restaurant where People may or may not have showed up for comedy, but there's everyone's talking or there's stuff going on. Like a comedy show is meant to happen with one person on stage and everyone else facing them and the room is at attention, so to speak. And so it's not that they're not horrible, but the comedian I feel like has to do more work, expend more energy to try to get people to focus as opposed to them already being focused in on them you know, in the theater. And so as soon as I saw Barbecue Pit, I was like, oh, here we go. And on top of that, we got to the Barbecue Pit and they said, well, it's not as big of a turnout as it usually is, probably because of the football game, but we'll still have a good crowd. Oh, and the game's on now, but we're going to turn off the game <laughs> right before the show starts. It's the worst thing to do. It's the worst thing to do to a comedian when people were at the barbecue pit in the South to watch the football game. 
not to come to comedy night. Some came for comedy night, but certainly not the whole place. And then you're going to turn off the football game, the thing that they came there to watch. That's the first way to start off your night with a boo. <laughs> like, it's not, it's not good. And so sure enough, they turn off the TV and some people left and some people were bothered. But then, you know, whatever. The guy, the host got on stage and he said he was going to do a certain amount. And I don't think he did as much time as he said he was going to do because he did not get a single laugh. I mean, he just, he just struggled. And he's a funny guy. I've seen him before. But he didn't get a single laugh. And then he goes, well, how about who's ready for me to bring some real comedians up here? And one person went. <laughs> <laughs> Got one pathetic little clap, and then I was the next one to go. I was like, "Oh my god, I can't!" And sure enough, I mean, it was like pulling teeth. It and you and I was doing material that I've done before, plenty of times that works, plenty of places. But it's like we said before, like there's no guarantees, and that everything they everything was set up to make it sort of be a disaster. Mm -hmm. Like it just, it just was like, I worked at Starbucks before and they used to say, set everybody up for success. Set the, ne the next shift that's coming in, set them up for success. Have the station cleaned, have da 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 Even if it's not your job, you're, you're setting it up for the next person. And it's, it's that same thing, the same thing with comedy. It's like it, the best shows are the ones in which the comedians are set up to do well. You know, whether it's the environment, the people, the host, the energy, but it, to the layout of the room, like the things that you don't even think matters. It's so easy to blame a comedian for like not being good when they haven't been set up. And, uh, you know, a lot of people say, oh, you can't blame the audience if you're not funny. And sometimes I agree with that, but sometimes I really don't. Like sometimes I just think there are no win situations. And I think the comedian did do as best as they could and they just they had an off night, you know, and, mm -hmm. um, and that's the same thing. People say, Oh, customer service, customers always right. Honestly, they're not Nope. like customers are jerks. People who they're say that have never worked in customer service. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I think the same is true. And I remember I got off stage. Oh, and towards the end I do, you know, I like to include a little bit of depth in my comedy and I did. I wondered how much I should include. Cause I was at the barbecue pit and I was like, I don't know how much people want to hear my depth. Um, but I did say a little bit, you know, right. like ab about dating and I have this joke about dating a guy. And so I say a little bit about, you know, certain types of guys before or knowing your worth. And I made some, you know, right before I get to the funny part, I say something about the importance of, of knowing your worth. And so I said something like, you know, I, I used to make really poor choices, especially about men. And before I could even keep getting to the joke part, this like drunk guy in the back just goes, yo. <laughs> And I was like, yeah, choices like that guy. <laughs> like, <laughs> and then he just kept like, he kept trying to like, it's like that person in the audience that's trying to get the attention back, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'm always constantly trying to figure out how much do I engage because I need, I want to show that I can control it or how much do I let it go because I don't actually want to give them all of the attention that right. they're trying to get. I mean, right. even that's kind of like, hmm. So I remember I got off that show and my husband, it was like an hour and a half drive. And my husband drove us back home and I got in the car and I just cried. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I don't know if I could do this. I don't know what happened. I don't know. And, and I mean, I fortunately have a really supportive husband who's just like, babe, you did the best that you could do for the circumstances in which mm -hmm. you were put. And you have to be okay with the fact that you, you did the best that you could. And that response doesn't mean that you're not good. It doesn't mean you're not capable. It doesn't mean you won't kill it at your next show. This is just a fluke in the story that you'll tell on a podcast one day. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. Um, it's yeah. Those shows can be so disheartening. Now, was that the weirdest place you've ever performed? Uh, the strangest like location. What's the weirdest show? The weirdest show. We That's, like that's bachelorette party or uh you know oh, oh like no, a the, sweet 16 party or you know weirdest show i ever did was i did it with lisa the um it was the bridal extravaganza <laughs> in san diego a bridal fair 
and they had this whole, but it was a, um, I don't know what they're called. You know, it's like a convention style. Mm -hmm. I don't know what those events are called, but you have all the vendors like and all the expo. Yes, yeah. it's a bridal expo. And they had um, all the different stations of whether it was people that did cakes or people that did stationery or people that did uh, tabletops or whatever, dancing lessons. And so, you know, all this stuff. And they had a stage with a catwalk in the middle. And so they had this whole evening planned, but the whole expo is going on while the evening is planned, while the stage mm -hmm. stuff is also going on. So it's a, it's not like, okay, expo's over, now come to the stage. It's right. like expo happening. And also something happens to be happening on stage, right? Again, right. we're set up for comedy. Like you need people's attention. <laughs> and so, the, and the way they had it set up was not to be a comedy show. They had, um, they had a catwalk with bridal dances or bridal dresses. And then they had a dancing couple that showcased the dancing lessons. And then they had a comedian. And then they had a, a catwalk with bridesmaids or there, you know, one was wedding, one was the bride, one was the bridesmaid. And then later they had another comedian, which was Lisa. So I was the first comedian, but it's not even like we went together. Right. It's not like, here's the comedy. It's not even like, here's an option for having comedy at your wedding. I really don't even know why we were there. I don't know why we were invited. I don't know. <laughs> I don't. I, and you had to audition to do it. They held auditions. And and so I I remember going through the audition process, like, yeah, this would be cool. And then I got there and I was like, who the heck did I audition for this? Because it made no sense to me. And so sure enough, you get on stage and yeah, there's some people sitting in the audience and some mm -hmm. people are paying attention. But as the person on stage, it is so hard for you to focus on what's right here in front of you when all of this noise and background. So you're trying to give these people your attention, but at the same time, they're also kind of distracted by what's going on over here. And mm -hmm. they might have missed that sentence that you said that's the thing that made the punchline funny. Right. And so it just... It was so awkward. Like it was fun because Lisa and I, again, the friend thing, like I think if mm -hmm. you, any show can be horrible, but it can be such a fun, horrible experience if you do it with a friend. Like, right. And you get to tell the battle story afterwards, you know? Well, it's always fun to watch your friends bomb, which is. Oh, fun. it's the so, best. <laughs> well, and here's the, the interesting thing from people who maybe aren't uh, comedians or who, who book shows and they'll always say, we're going to do a comic and then we'll do music and then we'll do a comic. And I always tell uh, people, if you're going to do comedy, have it all together because trying to get everyone's attention and focus is hard enough to do once. Yep. Um, and so That's then good. once you do that, like music is always like background noise and it, it invites talking and invites all that. So it's like they, they focus for a little bit, then they lose focus and it's so much harder to get them back that second time. So if you're going to yep. do comedy, just have it one straight shot of comedy, you know, before or after music. That's, that's really, yep. That's really good. Hard yeah. Yeah. Um, now what is the, the biggest mistake you see uh, young comics making newer comics? Um, I would say trying to be someone that they're not just so that they can try to be a comedian. Mm. So like they think, a lot, not all, but a lot of people think there's this one definition of comedy and you have to do that and be like that in order to be a successful comedian. And I think just because comedians have become successful a certain way, it doesn't mean that that's the formula for what to do with being a comedian. And I would say, especially like comedians that, um, I see a lot of young comedians think that comedy is just all you have to do is be super crass and make people feel uncomfortable right. and get a little shock and awe response and you're funny. And I'm not here to say that there's not like crude humor out there that isn't funny. I, there's many different forms of comedy and I'm, I've enjoyed many a different forms, but I, I will say, like I said, I, I, I don't think there's a formula. And I think I, the mistake I think I see them making is, Oh, they have to do this crude, crass, shock and awe in order to be a comedian. And so I've watched, especially like, especially at an open mic, you watch a certain type of person. You, in my experience, watching a certain type of young guy get up on stage and just talk about mm -hmm. his body parts and 
sex and women when he looks like he's barely even held a girl's hand, but he thinks <laughs> he's supposed to be talking about these shocking things. Like it's just, it's not even right. believable. It's not even funny because it actually feels uncomfortable seeing someone so uncomfortable talking about these very intense things. Right. Like, and I, same thing with a grown man. I watched a grown man once who in real, I met him before the show, such a nice man, so kind and accommodating. And he was new to comedy. And then I saw him got on stage and he tried to be the comedian that was like, you know, my wife is such a B and my daughter, you know, and they started the period of the same, like he starts bashing as what is the bashing the family mm. type comedian. And, I, and everybody felt uncomfortable. And I was like, dude, it's not even what you're saying isn't even believable. Right. Because that's not you. Like that's not, you can't even say that with confidence because even you know, that's not you. And so it's not coming across as funny or even like you're joking about your wife. It seems like you're trying to, for some reason, throw your wife under the bus so that you can figure out right. how to become a comedian. <laughs> like it just, it's so uncomfortable to watch young comedians try to be someone that they're not just so they can impress what they think the masses want to hear when more often than not, it's not actually what they want to hear. Well, and you know what else is funny about that too is there are so many uh, young single male comics that talk about how terrible they are in bed and all these these failures of yeah. you know of themselves, and then they go try to pick up women after the after? show. Like you just told us, you're awful at all of these things and all ah. these problems with you. Ah. And <laughs> oh, totally. They're, they're going to be like, oh yes, totally sign me up for that. Mm -hmm. so don't do that <laughs> just yeah to... <laughs> so yeah. we're at... it's, it's so funny yeah being a, a woman in comedy i definitely like had the opposite of, of experience where i would like share my baggage so as to keep the guys from approaching me afterwards because mm -hmm. it was like no i've already shared that i eat my feelings and i'll tell you about my therapist on the first date and <laughs> Usually guys are like, okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're uh, talking with JJ Barrows. Uh, she's a comedian. She's an artist, uh, author, speaker. Uh, you can follow her um, all over the internet. She's got so many things. Uh, JJBarrows.com. Uh, if you're interested in seeing her artwork, it's at uh, society6, uh, the number six, dot com slash JJ Barrows. Follow her on Facebook at JJ Barrows Comedy. Uh, Instagram at JJ Barrows, on Twitter at Jenny Joy, J E N N I E Joy B, the letter B. And uh, it's you have the book called It's Called a Spade. And she has a Dry Bar Comedy special out, which is very funny, uh, called Dry. Uh, so go to drybarcomedy.com slash JJB and you can check that out. Um, so, so JJ, you, you talked a little bit about being a, a female and, um, and some of the challenges, you know, that you, you do to, to kind of keep the men away. Did you find any other issues with um, being a female? Have you gotten any backlash? Have you gotten any? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. I should clarify. It's not that men were swarming to get to me. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's not like I had to, like, beat them off by any means. It was just if, performing comedy, especially as a beginner, when you're when you're in some sketchy places, like, there's there's a certain quality that you're looking for and it and it and it usually ain't there. So if you yeah. know a guy can handle therapy, then he can probably handle taking me out on a date. But that was <laughs> that would just kind of like weed out the undesirables like right off the bat. Um, but yeah, I would say I would say being um, yeah, it's very comedy is so interesting because there is still this for some reason I can't wrap my head around it. There's still this train of thought that there is this belief that like women aren't funny. Like that's actually an argument that, that I still hear that, that people make. I mean, that's a comment people have made even on my, my, my dry bar, you know, it, mm -hmm. it's, it's awesome to have something that goes, you know, viral or that gets out to a lot of places. It's also in some ways kind of scary because it means the door opens to way more opinions that you didn't even necessarily want to find. Um, and so, you know, you can tell yourself all the things like, Oh, it's about them or, it's not personal, even though comedy feels very personal. Um, you can say all the things that you know. It doesn't mean I'm not this, doesn't you know. Right. But it doesn't mean it doesn't still, you know, hurt or, or, or suck to, to hear it. And so I think I think both being a woman um, in, a, in a very male-dominated field, 
Um, same with surfing. I mean, tell you, they, they just go hand in hand. There's this <laughs> awkward feeling when I get out in the lineup and it's all men and I'm just like, ugh. Um, and they definitely don't want me to get the wave because they want to prove that it's their wave and who's the girl to cut them off. And it's just, it's very aggressive. Um, and then obviously like with the time, amount of time, you know, people get very aggressive about how long they've been doing it. And so they feel like they deserve more and but like you said, like if I came just because I entered the comedy game late as a form of doing comedy doesn't mean I didn't have tons of experience or work, whether it was on my own stuff, mm -hmm. whether it was the stage, whether it was knowing how I wanted to present myself because I knew who I was. The only difference was comedy doesn't mean I haven't had years of experience entertaining crowds or getting to know myself in a way that would uh, that would lead me to, to where I end up with comedy. And so um, I've definitely gotten comedy or responses or comments that are like, you know, she she's hasn't been doing it long enough. She's not she who does she think she is like why even dry bar, <laughs> you know, how does she get a dry bar? What do I get? A dry, or, or people that got it, but that, you know, they've been doing comedy longer. So it, it, it's a bother to them that that I got it, too. Um, well, if I can touch, just touch on that real quick. First of all, it's um, that's the nature of the business we're in. It's show business. It's entertainment. Yeah. And they're looking for certain things. Um, they're looking for demographics. They're looking for um, different types of, of people. And just because uh, people go, oh, she only got this because she's a woman or she only got this that, because yeah, whatever. Um, and, and that's yeah that's what they're looking for they're looking yeah. for female voices like yeah because there aren't I, any there right and it doesn't mean that you yourself aren't funny or that you right. won't get a chance to do it but it, it same like in the climate that we're in there's voices that are that people are looking for that it's okay that it's different from yours it, it doesn't yeah. matter how much it's not saying anything about you or your no. time or your length of work it's like, and let's say, let's say, <laughs> even if the only reason I got whatever is because I'm a woman, I'll take the door to walk through. If you need women, I'll be that voice. But guess what? You still have to be good. Right. You still have to be good at what you do for them to even want to publish what you have to say. And so even with my dry bar, I mean, I heard a lot of, I mean, I hate to say it, but like middle-aged mm -hmm. white male voices Mm -hmm. say I'm not ready I'm not prepared I haven't been doing it long enough I only got it because I'm a woman I only you know the xyz and it's like they they gave me my rough cuts like within weeks I mean they they released it within I mean it was in and I don't say that to, yeah I don't say that within a month literally yeah. like I don't say that to to toot, I think I, yeah, it might have been even less. I don't say it to toot my own horn, but I say it to remind myself because I am so easily like um, affected by the comments. And I, I start to, it's like I was saying with the kid, right? In the world. And all of a sudden there, it's like, I can function in so much confidence. And all of a sudden I hear all these comments and I go, oh my God, like, are they right? Should I not show up? Should I not yeah. bring what I have to the table? Da, da, da. But then that's where I have to remind myself, and I say it to remind myself, they they released my special within a month of me doing it because the director himself came up to me after my first performance and was like, what you just did in the first show, do that again in the second show. That's my only note to you. Because he he was get, he would give every comedian notes about what could they could do different and da-da-da-da. And, and same, he said, it, it doesn't mean I'm at the top of my game. It doesn't mean I don't still have work to do. I want to still expand more and get more stage time. It doesn't mean I don't still have stuff to hone in on and perfect. I know that about myself. Right. But it doesn't mean I'm not good, I'm not capable, I'm not ready, or I don't have a place just because I don't have the 25 year credit of comedy work that you do to your name. Like people just, they need well, to let it go. <laughs> yeah, and what well, what it does show is it shows that you were good enough for uh, at where you are right now, and they saw that and said, "We want to showcase this." And yeah. it doesn't mean you're not going to get better. You are going to get better. You know, yeah. like that's just the nature of it. Now, for example, like you said, you you got your your stuff within a month. Um, now, 
I've been doing comedy 23 years. And so when you were like, I got dry bar, I was like, awesome. You know, like I was very happy for you, but a part of me was very uh, yeah. jealous, uh, not of you, but just that you get those thoughts of like, well, that, how come totally. I didn't get one? And and that's a, it's a very normal thing because it's all very personal. And then I ended up getting a dry bar special, like, you know, a few weeks later and I filmed it in January and my cuts haven't come in yet. You know, we're yeah. filming this now middle of June and, you know, mine are going to come in later on in the year. And part of me is like, well, I need to, you know, why didn't that, why didn't I go first? And that's, it's a very, it's a very normal thing, but I don't begrudge anyone um, if they're, if they have a plan and they have an agenda of like, okay, we're going to focus on this and this and this, because we feel that this will be better for our, our product and our brand and right. uh, our platform where we have, you know, they see the whole big picture that I don't see. Right. Um, and so you just have to go, I'm, I'm very thankful that I have that and it's going to come out and I'm looking forward to that. And yeah. you just have to let it go. But again, when people just say, oh, you know, oh, you weren't ready or whatever, they're not the ones making the choices. Yeah. You know, like, it, yeah. you're not and the it, one signing the check. If you're not signing the check, I don't really care what yeah. you, what you and think. I remember you saying that to me, what, that same kind of thing. It's like, if they aren't signing the check, I don't care what they have to say. And like, it, it was just a good reminder of the person that wanted me to do it the person that matters is the person that is paying me to do it because exactly. they already saw what they wanted and they, and they said that, you know, they, they wanted you. And so, yeah, I totally get, I mean, and again, that that's where it goes back to me having to tell myself sometimes and it says more about them than, than it does Absolutely. about me. And so for me, it becomes just showing up and doing the best that I can instead of getting caught up in the Facebook comments or defending myself right. or, well, here's why I, I, it's like, I don't have the time or the energy right? And to, you don't need to dive to. into this. Yeah. And again, it, just, it's, it's, it's not, it wasn't your call, you know, like yeah. I'm going to cut everybody in, you know, I'm going to go first. My special is going to come out before yours. Yeah. Like that's, it's not, it's not in your, your control. So you just, you show up, you say, they say, look here and you go, yep. Tell your jokes. Great. And then they, yeah. they do what they do. And again, it just shows that you have that, um, ability and that skill level uh, for where you're at that they were like, we'd love this. Yeah. And you're only going to continue to get better. And so, yeah. I mean, if you look at early, look at anybody early, Jerry Seinfeld, you know, like his first yeah. stuff was very different than later. Like you learn right. and you develop and we all grow through this process. So yeah, yeah, totally. Sure. It's it's been an interesting it, it, dry bar. It was like one of those again. It's like with the awareness thing, right? It's like yep. I was so excited, and I really thought that when I got it, I was like, I didn't. I don't think I shared about it at first when I found out because part of me was like, "There's no way. Like, there's no way they picked me. I'm right. not even going to share it. Like, just in case I hear back and they're like, oh, sorry, that was a mistake,' or oh, we changed right. our minds.' Like, I legit right. like didn't talk about it. I think for months, honestly from the time that I found out and um, cause I just, I just, I doubted so much myself and then I didn't doubt myself and my ability, but I just, I don't know whether it's the voices or what I just like, I was like, I want to be sure. And right. so it was such a mix uh, when I did finally share it, I was so excited, but again, it opens that door of for course. people, for people to make their comments. And then that, but yeah, like you said, that's, that's when you just kind of have to go back to, you know, what, it's okay that, People can have their feelings. I have my feelings. Like clearly I get even like heated <laughs> about this. It, I, it's okay for people to feel however they go. I still do it. If I see someone got a show or if I see someone got something, I'm like, oh, dang. You know, doesn't yeah. mean I'm not stoked right. for them, especially if they're a friend. Literally what you just said, like it's so easy to be excited when it's your friends that get something like that. And at the same time, you can be like, gosh, I want to do that. Yeah, like, what exactly. if I, if I can do that. But that's a very different approach from like, an intentional sort of like attack almost. Right. I don't even know if it's meant to be an attack, but what can come across as an attack because of your own insecurity where you're at. So if I do see that someone has gotten something, even if I do feel a twinge of what about me? Right. I am intentional about saying like, congratulations. Right. That's amazing. How exciting. Um, and then the next question, how'd you get that? Yeah. <laughs> I got that question so much. <laughs> I was like, honestly, I don't know. 
<laughs> that's what every comic does. Oh, that's awesome. Who books that? Yeah. Every uh, how'd you get that? Time. Yeah, it's so funny. <laughs> I half the time I was like, I yeah, I don't know. I'm I don't know. They just I don't even want to tell them they me. Yeah, me. exactly. <laughs> These guys they they just contact me and I, uh, I have no idea. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. So, you know, you talk about that, like the negative comments and, and, um, that now having done dry bar and getting a bigger fan base that you, that you've uh, been getting, um, we talked a little bit about this offline was that, um, you like to have incorporate a message in your comedy, which is one of the things I love about your comedy. That's one of the things, you know, I try to do as well. That's why we, we, we click so well. <clears throat> um, you've been getting some feedback from people kind of saying like, well, don't talk about this or, you mm. know, just have you been getting that, that sort of thing? Yeah. I think especially um, in the climate that we're in right now, at least when this is, this is being recorded in mm -hmm. June of 2020. Um, <laughs> it's it, there, there's a lot that's, that's been going on between, between the coronavirus, between quarantine, between the racial tension, between, um, I, I mean, there's just, there's so much going on that has been going on and people have been in their homes and, and pent up for a while that I think emotions are even all the more so because we're having to sit with them mm -hmm. when we're used to kind of doing other things with them or distracting or whatever. And so emotions are high right now. Right. And not for not for no good reason. Like there's, there's, there's some really horrible things in, in my opinion going on. And, um, and I think it's hard for a comedian when something, well, when, you know, it's, it's hard for a comedian to figure out how to navigate any sort of heavy topic, um, in the world. Maybe it's not hard for most, but if you want to do it in a way that isn't offensive right. to everyone, or you're the comedian that's like, I don't give a crap what people think. Like there's, I'm not right. that comedian. And so right. <laughs> Because I care about not just being a comedian and not just making people laugh, but I care about being a person in this world that um, facilitates good conversations and that I'm, I, I consider myself like a female Mr. Rogers. Like I want to create friendly neighborhoods, even if online, and I want people to figure out how to love each other and be kind to each other. It does not mean you have to think the same way. It does not mean you have to agree on anything or everything, but you can still be kind. Right. Um, in the midst of it. And so because I function like that, it's very tricky sometimes to figure out um, n not only how to do comedy, but but also just how to address when very intense, heavy, tragic things go on in the world and where I see so much divisiveness between people. And so I think the mistake that people make towards entertainers of any kind is that if any sort of um, tragedy takes place, in the world or whether it's political or not an entertainer voices how they feel about it and and i see all the time this automatic response of shut up and sing yeah stick shut to comedy and, yeah, yeah shut up and tell jokes shut up and dribble some woman said that to lebron james yeah i think it was lebron you know when he yep. expresses his feelings and it's like you telling someone to shut up about this topic that, that they are experiencing is literally sucking the heart right out of what they do. The reason right. you connect to what they do is because of the heart that they put into it. And to tell them to just shut up and tell jokes is basic. It doesn't, it, it, it doesn't even mean you want to hear jokes. It means you want to hear what you agree with. Right. And since they're saying something you don't agree with, you want them to shut up. And then you want them to entertain you. And so it's not even about their level of or ability to entertain. It's about your own self-centeredness to either hear what you want to hear, or if you don't say what I want to hear, you better entertain me. Right. That reveals the person who's saying it, that reveals your self-centeredness. And I think the biggest mistake people make, especially right now, especially with comedians, is I've seen comedians come out and I've seen them speak on everything that's going on between the coronavirus, between um, Black Lives Matter, between the racial tension and, and how that's playing itself out. And I've seen so many people say, that's not your place to address that. You just tell jokes, you just stick to the funny. And it's like, just because this person does comedy, just because this person has entertainment most often that you see to offer the world, does not mean they are only a comedian. 
and does not mean they're only an entertainer, nor are they to do so for you. They're not, they're still a person and right. they're a person who has feelings. They're a person who has emotions. They're a person who has thoughts. They're a person who has a social media following in the same way that the grocer does. And the grocer gets on and says his comments and you don't see as many people saying stick to the groceries. You see, know, I do that to people when online, when they, uh, cause uh, comedians, we're social commentators where that's what we do. We observe and we talk about the absurdities or the uh, hypocrisy or the, you know, whatever, the irony of life. Um, there, there are variations. Some people are very political or social or whatever, and some people are more, um, and I, I kind of fall into this category. I want to kind of just take you away from what's going on and entertain you. Yeah. Um, but again, we're, we're all humans. We all have thoughts. Yeah. But when I see somebody who goes like, uh, I see it with sports reporters all the time, they're like, stick to sports. And so then yeah. I go look up that person's, what they do, and they're like a banker. And I'm like, stick to banking. You know, yeah. just right back at you. Like, then who are you? Who are you to, to, to tell someone to stick to something unless your whole thing is, yeah. uh, you know, whatever the topic is? Yeah. And you don't have to agree right. with their feelings or their thoughts, but it doesn't mean you – that doesn't mean they don't have feelings or thoughts and it doesn't mean they're not allowed to express them. It's just like when the person that comes up to me or not that they come up, but if someone finds out in conversation that I'm a comedian, cause I'm not, I don't think many are, but I, I don't, I don't think most comedians are the type that's like, Hey, I'm a comedian, you know, like, unless they're like, <laughs> unless I've maybe they're heard new. one person do that. And yeah, but so I'm not the type of person that announces it. So if it does come up in conversation and they're like, that, you know, I'm a comedian. And if their response is, oh, so tell me a joke. I literally say, I'm sorry, I'm off the clock. <laughs> like, because it's just not my job. Even though I do comedy, it is right. not my job to 24-7 entertain you. Right. It's yeah. not my job to not care about what's going on in the world and just be funny. Because I'm still a human. And my job is very separate from who I am as a human. So I don't know what it can or, or should look like, but entertainers, it is not their sole job just to entertain. Yeah, I get it. There's business and, oh, this is what they signed up for. And I, no, they signed up to do what they do, which is, or what they love, which is whether it's to play music or to play sports or to be comedy. But just because they're expressing opinions or emotions outside of the time frame in which they're doing them doesn't mean they're not doing their job. And it doesn't, it, they're still a human. They're yeah. still a human experiencing this chaos of life in the same way that maybe a different way, but they're still experiencing the chaos that everybody else is experiencing it. Yeah. It's, it's always funny because people sit there and do, Oh yeah. Tell me a joke. And I just say, Oh yeah. Pay me. Yeah, <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah. You know, pay me. You pay me enough. I'll dance for you. Uh, I don't care. You know, like whatever, but it's, mm -hmm. it's so true. And, yep. and the thing is, you know, I, I, and I'm sure we'll, we, we'll be talking about this uh, soon. JJ and I are actually doing a, a conversation with a, a couple of our uh, uh, African-American friends and talking about race and all that sort of stuff. It's, it's about having nuanced conversations. It's not all just this way or that way. It's, yeah. it's so, you know, when someone has a different opinion, you just sit there and I try to listen and just kind of go, okay, well, have you thought about this? But most people, while you're saying what you're saying, they're just, waiting for that moment to yep. jump in and tell you why you're wrong and you have to view it their way as opposed yep. to just going, Oh, I could see how you, you would see that. And yep. so it's, it's, it's just, uh, it's, I, like I said, I try not to, I, I made a, um, I made a separate social media uh, account, uh, for myself on Twitter so that I can express what I want to express without oh, having the today. backlash. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, just because I don't want to, you know, like I said, I, I've kind of labeled myself as like, I'm just here to entertain and, you know, right. take away from that. But, you know, who knows that may, that may change, but yeah, I've kind of just taken a break from social media, at least altogether the last couple of weeks, especially I kind of, um, I mean, I was doing, I was trying to do week, I was doing two videos a week and I mean, when we went into quarantine, I kind of just went into go mode. Like I just right. was like, all right, how can I show up? How can I help? You know, I don't have a ton of money. I don't have like a huge platform. I'm not an influencer with millions of followers, but like, what can I do to the people that I do know that are in my audience to help in this time, especially knowing I can't go out and perform. And so my, my way of doing that was to, was to create these videos. And I, I love doing it. It was great. I mean, it was a lot of work 
I don't think people realize the amount of work that goes into making them, but it was so much work, but it gave me something to do. It was a, it was a win-win. It gave, gave me purpose. It gave me something to do and to work towards accountability. I set a time, yep. what days I was, you know, going to get what done by and, and, and I had a great response and, and, and people loved them and they looked forward to them. And it, in some ways they might've touched on things that just would maybe challenge people to look at things a different way, but they were never like accusatory. Like I think this about what's going right. on. It was literally just to entertain and have fun and, and kind of be lighthearted about everything that's going on. But I, so I did that for like nine weeks, uh, nine weeks. And, um, and then I just got tired. I, I, I got so tired and I just, I needed a break. And, um, and it was in the middle of when everything kind of started coming out um, with, with everything with George Floyd and I, I seeing what was happening online again, my own night, me being naive, I've just in so many situations, I, I it's like my lifelong lesson to become more aware because I just see the areas in which I've failed because of my own ignorance. But, um, I just thought here, this heartbreaking thing happened. And I just kind of thought that would be the response, how horrible this is, but to see how it actually birthed so many arguments and mm. so much divisiveness over the opinion, like just the opinions yeah. of what happened. It was kind of shocking to me. And it, um, and it felt like a no win situation even to say anything because someone had something to say about something. And, for me, it was like, well, I, I don't think the answer is to say nothing because it sounds like that's what's been part of the problem. Right. But I also see that that it also sounds like we, and when I say we, I, I, I guess I'll, I'll, I could say white people, but I will include myself and I, I'll just speak for myself. I am someone who maybe hasn't listened to what's been going on for a long time because I didn't think there, there was a problem. And so you can't really tell the masses what to do until you've worked on it yourself. And so I realized I, I just, I need to actually listen before I, I chime in with a specific opinion. I don't, you know, and so I, I showed up, I did a live painting um, my ninth week. I wanted to show up. I wanted to say, I don't know what to say, but I know showing up and, and, and speaking about injustice and, is, is, is way better than saying nothing. And so if these aren't the right words, I, you know, I don't know, but I'm, I want to learn what they are. And that might just have to start with saying something and building, you know, from there. And so I, I did this live painting and then I had actively decided that I was kind of going to take a break from social media in part because at least everything I was seeing on my own personal social media accounts. I mean, also it made me wonder what kind of audience I had, but I was like, <laughs> It is polluting me like with, with what I, and, and the stress and the anxiety and the like of everything. And again, it's not to say avoid tough feelings, like just go la la land. Like again, I, maybe that's, that's part of the problem, but at least the arguments on Facebook was not how I was going to learn. I, I, I became very aware that I had a lot to learn, but I needed to actually go learn that from, from very specific um, voices and people of authority in these, in these places, in these positions, more so than, you know, Aunt Yahoo down in wherever, who's going to express her opinion and stand by it and whatever, like just Facebook, Instagram, whatever. it was just a uh, noise, 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 noise. And again, I'm not here to say that there isn't things to learn on there and ways to make people aware, but I really knew that before I showed up again, I wanted to, to understand and be a little more educated. So I've spent the last few weeks very intentionally, um, not even on, so not even looking at social media because I wanted to know my own thought. I wanted to know what I thought. I wanted to know what I thought me in and of myself outside of what other people wanted me to think outside of what even my audience wanted me to think, you know, cause it's so mm -hmm. easy as an entertainer, you know, going from work, going from someone who worked in the service industry to someone in the entertainment industry, I've gone from being told the customer is always right to the audience is always right. And so I've been trained to believe you just do whatever they want you to do because they're the ones. And I thought that might work as a business model, but for me as an individual showing up in this world, especially if I'm about creating and, and facilitating, you know, friendly neighborhoods and, and, and wanting spaces to be safe and where we have constructive conversations. 
I need to be someone who knows what she herself believes outside of what her audience wants her to believe, what they want to hear her say. And so I just took the last few weeks off and I didn't even get on. I haven't um, checked it. And I've just been, I've been reading, I've been listening. I've been in conversations. Absolutely. You know, having a lot of conversations on the phone or through text message. So I'm not, I haven't checked out by any means. I, I wrote about it today. I haven't checked out. I've tuned in. Right. I've actually started paying attention instead of just, Hey, I'm going to entertain you. I'm going to distract you from what's going on. I'm not saying that's what everyone is doing. Who's entertaining. I, I do right. believe laughter to be medicine, but for me, and I, I mean, I wrote about this today for me, I know I only got good at comedy because I dealt with my own pain. Right. You know, it's like that thing comedy for a lot of people, it comes from pain, but you can't be funny about it until you've dealt with it. And so for me, I realized, you know, I might've dealt with my own pain, but there is a communal pain that I have not seen that I have completely ignored, not even mm -hmm. intentionally. And I think I need to sort through that before I can even start to make jokes. Well, and it, it's hard because, you know, you, you, uh, and I talk to a lot of the, you know, the, the, the legends in the, in comedy and they just say, you can't, you can't go out there and, um, do what the people want, do what you think the people want you to do. You have mm -hmm. to go out and be authentic and you have to be you. But when you're on the other side of it, building that fan base and trying to, you know, start to get ahead, you, you certainly don't want to necessarily alienate people you know, that gets in your, your brain of yeah. like, Oh, I don't want to, I don't want to say this because then people might not like me and then I'll lose followers or I'll lose whatever. And social media, uh, as much as, you know, people just go, Oh, just don't be on social media. Uh, as entertainers, unfortunately, yeah. that is the currency in which we are judged by. Yeah. So it doesn't matter that you're funny, uh, to a producer or, uh, you know, certain bookers or whatever. It doesn't matter if you're good or you're bad or whatever. How many followers do you have on Facebook? How many followers yeah, do you have on Instagram? How, like crazy. that's all, uh, that's, that's kind of the, the currency now for, for people who aren't, you know, Jerry Seinfeld and, you know, yep. Brian Regan and, and people like that. So they go, well, how many followers do you have? And because they want to know, are you going to be able to put butts in seats? And that's really what they care about. Again, it's show business. And I think it's, one of the things that I really liked about, you know, starting up Encore Comedy with you was um, we wanted to shift from that model of, yeah. of that. And we wanted to, uh, we wanted to entertain, yes, but we also wanted to inspire and, and give some hope and some message and, um, and help heal people uh, through, through humor and you know also do it in a way that could benefit other people and charities and, and foundations and nonprofits. and i think that was one of the my favorite parts of, of setting up encore that's basically the whole point of this <laughs> yeah yeah so it's it's kind of a, an interesting thing so people are always like oh I'll just get off social media i despise social media i okay. i wish i could not be on it you know but I, I, I really do. Although I'm, I'm enjoying doing these. I, I really am enjoying doing these because I love talking comedy and I love, you know, uh, talking yeah. shop and all that. And I, I, I'm trying to bring some awareness to some, some good organizations, which I guess we should just lead into your organization that you wanted to, oh, to spotlight yeah, yeah. today. Yeah. That'd be so, awesome. Uh, yeah. So tell us a little bit about Just Embrace. Just Embrace. Um, Just Embrace is, I guess the, to help people give a friend, it is a nonprofit. Um, but for me, it's more than that. It's, it's hard to explain because it's a, it's a community of people. Um, but you know, businesses, people always want, well, numbers and statistics and definitions. Put it in the box. Put it yeah. In the box. Put it yep. in the box. And yep. it just, in my opinion, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't belong in a box. Um, it's, it's this woman share and it, it started back when I used to live in Chicago and we would go down to the train station and we would um, hang out. I don't even, I can't even call all of the people that we hung out with homeless. I don't, I don't know if they all were, but it, um, it was people who were definitely maybe more the outsiders um, mm -hmm. in life, many of whom were homeless. Um, and we I don't even, I think the first time we did it, um, 
we had a pie party or something and we served pie and the pie was just the method, the tool. It wasn't about the pie. It wasn't about feeding the homeless. It wasn't about us little suburban kids going down and feeling good about ourselves for a Sunday. The pie was the connector. It was the piece that would give us something to say, hey, not it's not even just about serving you, but it gave us an in mm -hmm. to say hello, to how are you, to who are you, to facilitate conversation, to start people just having conversations with each other and just treating people like people and not even seeing, not even making it be about the differences between us, but literally just developing relationships with people. And I think maybe sometimes we took sandwiches down, but eventually we just, it wasn't even about stuff. We didn't bring stuff because we didn't want to be the kids that, you know, we show up every week, they're coming for food. And not that that's a bad thing, but but we wanted to make a point that we're, we don't think, we're not the, we're not the saviors here in this picture. We just, there's something that organizations are missing about relationships with, with people, right? And so the intention was just to go down and, and hang out for a Sunday afternoon and hang out with them. And we did, we would like walk all over the city together and we would hang out in the train station. And sometimes, you know, I remember one time, like I got in an art, not an argument, but you know, a cop was telling one of the guys to leave. And I was like, well, why does he have to leave? And I don't like, it was just this like really growing phase of me, of me learning that there are very real differences between how people are seen and then how they're treated. And I'm not even gonna say I handled that the way, the right way. Cause why way? Cause, um, Everyone has a story, but um, but there, that was just the birthplace of this this what became an organization, a nonprofit, and she carried that philosophy of of building relationships and of wanting people to know that they belong, of wanting people to live in relationship, not just on a Sunday afternoon, not just after a you know charity event, uh, you know, or not just a coat donation. Again, not that all of those things in and of themselves aren't wrong, but she very intentionally wanted people to live a life of, of relationship and of restoration. And part of that restoration um, involved building those relationships with people. And um, her, her, her three main things, I say her, but it's become this whole community of people um, is, is generosity, hospitality, and inclusivity. And those are, they're like, they're, I don't know if pillars is the word, um, but, those are the things that they incorporate into the way that they live their lives. And so she has this home in, in uptown Chicago and, and it is her home. She lives very much in this, in, in this neighborhood um, where again, people, all people, any people are welcome. It's essentially people who are isolated, who are alone. Some of them live in the, you know, government funded housing. Some of them live in the nursing home. Some of them don't have homes. Some of them they might not see for weeks and then they show up out of nowhere and they're just as welcome. Some of them might come high. Some of them might not like they, they it's, it's facilitating this community of people who did not have a home before and not so much as in the structure of a home, but a people to care about them as a family. Not that they don't maybe still have them outside of that, but living in this restored version of what it means to be a family and, and to love people. And so she throws birthday parties. They, I say she, cause she was the chair. She is the um, founder essentially of, of, of just embrace, but she has very much built the whole community into everyone being an active member of making it what it is. And so even if it's giving so like all different people tasks of what to do or what to bring and they have, birthday parties for everybody in the community. They have funerals when someone dies. I mean, the 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 amount of, of deaths that that community has experienced, whether it's because of violence or whether it's because of sickness or um, natural causes or whatever, like it, they have, they honor the people's lives that sometimes are easily forgotten because they're just the people that are so easily looked over in society. They visit each other in nursing homes and um, they have, uh, holidays together. They throw Thanksgiving dinners. I mean, they're a month of, from Thanksgiving to Christmas, I think she's hosting, I'm going to butcher it if she doesn't kill me, but like two or three dinners a month. And you have to actually sign up now people in the community um, because there's, she, she has so many and there's so many people that have heard about it, a place where they can come and not only feel like family for this one holiday month during the year, but they know it's a place they can consistently come back to 
however many times throughout the year. And so it's very much, it's a lifestyle. It's a way of living that is inclusive um, to every, to everybody, to, to anybody. There's not, there's, there's really not a, a um, I don't know what the word is, but there's, there's not some sort of standard that, that you have to have in order to be included or to be a part of it. They have foot clinics, they have educational um, sessions for different things. Um, they have, Bible studies, they have, I mean, uh, the resources are insane. You know, people, someone comes up with an idea for something else that they could facilitate or do in the community. She's like, okay, what would it look like to do that? She's, she's not only providing a space um, for people to come and feel welcome, but she's providing a space for people to know and be aware that they have a voice and to feel empowered to do something with that voice that they have and to actually be a person in that community to make a difference. And so it's really, it's really, beautiful to watch. Um, it's really beautiful to take part in. I'm, I'm more removed than I should be being. It's so easy to blame distance. Obviously, I'm in California and she's in Chicago, but she's one that even though the distance and time has gotten in the way that I've continued to pay attention to what she's doing because I don't see anybody else doing it. I see people doing good things for people, but I don't see people living lifestyles um, of not just helping people, but caring about people and empowering people, even empowering them to maybe not need their help. You know, it's really easy for us to pride ourselves on the help that we gave, but her, her point isn't even to help. It's, it's to help to a point that her help isn't needed. I don't know if that's the best way to put it, but it's an amazing organization and um, it's, it's, it's fully nonprofit and it's, um, mostly run off of donors and, you know, provide for things like the birthday parties and the, and, and the feasts and the housing. Um, and I, I just, I, I really think, especially if someone is a person of faith or in the faith community, I think it's one of the most modern day examples you can look at as for what would it look like um, to live out the message of the gospel um, and, and what Jesus was about, not the rules, but the lifestyle, you know, I think people get too caught up in the rules of the Bible, but there's, there's a lifestyle piece that so easily gets missed. And, and again, it's not a religious thing. I, I don't say that to say, um, you know, they're, they're spreading the religion. You know, if you want to harvest the numbers, this is the spot. They, that's not, that's not the goal of the point. The, the point is to live in relationship with people regardless. Her heart, her, she might come from a place um, that is faith-based, but her heart is relationship regardless of what the response is. And so um, it's just, it's a really beautiful, a really beautiful organization. And I, I, um, I just love what they're about. So that would be the, that would be the, the organization or the nonprofit that I, that I would want to highlight today. So I, I didn't hear all of that JJ because my, my internet went out and um, I know you just spoke about Just Embrace, uh, which is a wonderful organization. And you can check them out at uh, www.justjustembrace.org. Uh, you can check them out on Facebook at Just Embrace and on Instagram at Just Embrace Chicago. Uh, again, www.justembrace.org, uh, Facebook at Just Embrace, and Instagram Just Embrace Chicago. Um, so, JJ, this was really fun. Got a little weird there at the end, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> oh, we made it. We survived. <laughs> we did. We did. And I uh, oh. just want to say thank you again for, for coming on. Again, check out uh, JJ Barrows uh, at JJ Barrows Comedy on Facebook, Instagram at JJ Barrows, Twitter at Jenny, J-E-N-N-I-E, -E, Joy, the letter B, and at JJ Barrows.com. And for her art, it's Society6 uh, with the number 6.com slash JJ Barrows. Uh, she's got a book out called it's called the spade you can check that out at it's called the spade.com you can check out jj's to drive our comedy at www.drivearcomedy.com slash jjb you have so many credits Woo! jj that's crazy <laughs> take a sip of water <laughs> and then uh what is your youtube so that uh, people can see your uh stay in saturday shows that you did um youtube.com backslash jj barrows oh backslash that, pretty that's much if you search anything JJ Barrows. Barrows. It'll come up. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, uh, again, thank you so much for, for taking the time. I think we'll probably put this into two episodes because it was just that good. Cool. And yeah. uh, thanks again for uh, coming in, sharing your wisdom, and um, 
hopefully we can do something again soon. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Let's, let's have some fun. For sure. Thanks so, so much for having me. It was uh, fun. Thank you. And uh, thanks everyone for tuning in and, and uh, listening.